So thank you everyone for joining us today for the third webinar for the Carer Knowledge Exchange. Um, and today's webinar is about understanding the relationships between carer identity, care identification and carer wellbeing. My name's Elena Katrakis. I'm the CEO of Carers New South Wales and I'm really pleased to be chairing today's webinar. Um, just to start off, I'm just going to, uh, just a couple of housekeeping. Um, this session is being recorded um, and we ask that while our presenters are speaking today, if all other attendees could please keep their microphones on mute and turn off your cameras and videos, um, there'll be opportunities later in the session to unmute, see everyone. Um, but while the presentations are happening, it would be great if we could limit the questions and comments to the chat. So to start um, our afternoon uh, of lots of information, um, I'm going to hand over and welcome Michael West from the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council to welcome us to country. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Bojari Gamarua Gadigal Leora. G'day and welcome to Gadigal and Yora. Um, I'm uh, Uncle Michael from Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, and we're the custodians of the land air, water and culture within our boundary. And uh, it's important that we all work together and walk together for better outcomes. I do understand about being a carer because I've been a carer um, myself um, previously, and it can be quite um, taxing on people. And I don't understand, I don't think society fully understands the role of carers. So it's important that you do come together, you do do the research and collect the data. So I'm from an IT background and data is very important as I see, but it's also important to go out and have those young um, community members and carers and, and the people that they're caring for to get their opinion and get their um, experiences and record those. And um, where we are here, uh, UTS is the land of the Gadigal, one of the 29 clans of the Aura Nation. Across the harbour there, that coat hanging, you've got obviously Camaragal, which is a suburb of Camaray is named after. And next to us is Wongal. Um, if you're heading inland, like if you were actually, you know, traditionally in the waterways, you'd be in a Nawi, which is a canoe. And if you're heading inland, next to Camaragal is Walla Madigal. And if you keep going, you hit Parramatta, which is Barra Madigal, Barra meaning eel. And it's um, a very special place is coming back to the land council where those clans and other clans meet, have met for many, many millennia. And that's called Mimau, um, also known as Goat Island, but its real name is Mimau, which means eye of the eel. And it is um, a very special place, cultural place. And the eel's eye is actually looking up to the sky. There's a whole creation story of Sydney Harbour and the surrounding waterways create, created by eel. And it's important that we respect these places as, uh, as everyone, uh, as an Australian, has a responsibility to look after our culture and our sites. Of course, our culture and our sites is Australian culture um, when you think about it. And we want you to also learn about your own um, culture and your own identity where you come from it's very important that you do that and um, we encourage you to but also to care for our culture and our sites because our culture and our sites is your culture and sites so, so those sites as um as some of you may know the Brewarana fish traps um their engineering and aquaculture um they go back more than forty thousand years and then we have up the top um Aboriginal people did trade for more than um, 400, 500 years up the top there with Indonesian Macassans. Aboriginal people just didn't sit around singing Kumbaya. Male and females were warriors and still are warriors, um, fighting for our communities. It's important to understand that. And I'd like to acknowledge um, this land, as I said, and not acknowledge all the lands that you're on and that you do make connection to the community there and learn the stories of the country that you're on. And country has been speaking to us in the forms of firestorms and floods. And we need to respect her and look after her. It's also important to take a moment to pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander 
traditional owners, elders and custodians of the past, present and future, and pay respects to any actual Torres Strait Islander people online here today, and pay respects to country, and pay respects to all our ancestors. It's important to do that because we all return to our mother one day and become an ancestor. So um, we also need to acknowledge that we're still going through a pandemic, um, as you can see with the with the hybrid modes that we have, and that um, we did a pretty good job up until December, like only losing 2,000, but that's 2,000 people and 2,000 families or many families that have been affected. And we've lost, I think, about 10,000 almost since then. So we've still got a ways to go. We need to be treating people with respect and dignity. So if we have a moment of silence, a moment of reflection of our journey and paying respects to the ancestors, the elders and country for a moment, thanks. We have three beautiful waterways, the Hawkesbury, Nepean and George's, which actually have been flooded off lake when you think about it. Um, these are the boundaries of the Aura Nation. To my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters out there, we warmly welcome you from the country, the clan, the tribe and the nation you come from. And to all our brothers and sisters, we all belong to that one mob, one tribe humanity. We warmly welcome you from the country that you're coming from there, the family, community, and ultimately when you think about the country you're coming from, from this little planet we call Earth, um, floating through the ever-expanding cosmos. So on behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, our um, members, our board and our elders, welcome you here today. Um, continue the good work that you're doing. As I said, I have lived experience of being a carer and I understand how important it is that we do um, make society a better place for everyone. And always was, always will be actual land. It's, it's never been ceded. And um, we need to have some tough conversations in the future and continue them. And um, good leadership is about having a vision and taking people with you, being respectful, treating people with dignity and not being divisive. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michael. I think um, obviously the importance of identity for Aboriginal people and um, you know, thinking about identity today is part of what we're talking about um, and particularly acknowledging and thinking about the identity um, and complexity and challenges for Aboriginal carers, um, you know, not only across this state, but across the country as well. So yeah. thank you very much for reminding us about, you know, that, you know, and, and bringing that, you know, to our attention again. Oh, I think you've got a good person here online named June, which I know quite well. And <laughs> um, I, I have, I think, look, the book that was produced a few years ago, um, oh, was it Culture is Inclusion, which I think was, a, I think, the name of it, yeah. um, off the top of my head. And that it was a great, I was lucky to have the privilege to help launch that at the Human Rights Commission. And I think um, the way it was done with data collection, because I'm from an IT background, I understand that, but I think yarn is as important, if not more important, to come together to bring them all together. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much. Really, really Hi, appreciate you. Thanks, Michael. Hi, how are you? Good, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Okay, and we'll get, we'll get underway with our session. Yep. Thank you. The Carers Knowledge Exchange is an important partnership uh, and we're here really to achieve better outcomes for carers and um, to importantly connect research to practice because we often hear about a lot of research. It's about how we apply that to practice, um, which is very important. So um, the exchange delivers three webinars each year um, around a different focus area. And today's webinar is the first in our new focus area of improving carers' health and wellbeing. So this webinar has been informed by the recent Care and Knowledge Exchange um, incubator event, which was held in May this year. And one of the themes that really emerged out of that was about carer identification. Um, its diverse impact upon carer wellbeing. Um, and to think about and hear about research, practice and lived experience which all indicate that carer identification can improve the health and well-being of carers. 
However, every carer has a different experience of identity and identification. And I think we've seen um, some of the really positive things that carers can experience through identifying as a carer. We've um, framed this webinar today using a quote from one of the guest speakers that we had at the incubator, and that was Glennis. Um, and Glennis said, we have a diversity of relationships with the person we care for. It can be a partner, a young child, a young adult, a parent, a grandparent, even a great grandparent, a friend, a neighbor, a sibling, an aunt or uncle and more. And that diversity of relationships, we can have these relationships. However, the nature of the relationship we have with the person we care for um, can be quite different. And why we care can also be for many different reasons. Sometimes that's, that's out of love, sometimes it's out of obligation, sometimes it's um, a cultural expectation. Um, and all of these in differences really impact on the caring role. So care identity, care health and wellbeing. It's important to think about how all of those things come together and that that experience of identification, um, the nature of the relationship is different for every carer. And I think understanding um, that relationship between those different areas is really critical to providing really good um, targeted and specific carer support for an individual. So our Carers New South Wales Biennial Carer Survey also um, has provided further insight into the complexities of carer identities and relationships. So in our 2020 uh, carer survey, some carers responded that they experienced a bit of a blurring between their caring role and other roles that they had. Some responded in the survey that they didn't identify as a carer at all, um, even though they were responding to the carer survey. Uh, and some reported that identifying themselves as a carer was really empowering. So we look forward to seeing the results of the 2022 National Carer Survey um, in the coming months to see what that adds to the conversation about carer identity. So today is an important event to listen, listen to different experiences and examples of carer identity, carer identification and carer wellbeing, and to provide an opportunity to learn and reflect. So we're going to hear from three speakers over the next hour, offering three quite different perspectives on the topic of carer identity and carer identification as they relate to carer health and wellbeing. So following these presentations, we'll have a short break, um, hopefully around three o'clock, and then we'll convene um, after that for a series of facilitated breakout room discussions. And then we'll come back as a whole group to hear what some of those that discussion um, and reflections um, on the discussion, what that happened, you know, how that occurred in the breakout rooms, um, and that'll be followed and we'll close with a guided meditation session, which will be led by the Care and Knowledge Exchanges Carer in Residence, Prudence Granger. And that really is putting into practice the focus on carer health and wellbeing. So our very first speaker today is Jenny Nguyen. Jenny is our, um, she's a social worker specialising in neuro. She's also a carer for her younger brother who has hearing loss and neurodiverse behaviours. She became a carer at the age of 17, so she was a young carer. Um, she's currently a youth ambassador with Little Dreamers, a carer representative and member of the LGBTQI plus advisory group of Carers New South Wales. And she's involved in the carers program in Sydney local health district. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jenny and to Sarah Judd Lamb from Carers New South Wales, who's going to do a bit of a Q&A with Jenny to talk about some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, um, and hello, everyone. So my name is Sarah Judd Lamb, and I'm the Executive Manager of Policy Development and Research at Carers New South Wales. And I'm very pleased to be interviewing Jenny today um, to provide our first perspective, um, a carer's perspective. And so welcome Jenny, and thank you for sharing your experience as a carer um, as a really important contribution to today's topic. So we're gonna just go um, through a few questions uh, to hear a bit more about your caring role and your perspective on carer identity and carer identification. So um, could you please start by introducing yourself, Jenny? 
Yeah, thanks for having me here. My name's Jenny. I am now 25, so on the cusp of no longer being considered a young carer. Uh, I turn 26 next month, so um, um, it's mentioned already I'm a social worker. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, really. <laughs> we'll delve in. Not about you. <laughs> no problem. Um, so I guess we'd like to hear first from you about your experience in identifying as a carer. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I became a carer when I was 17. So I was about year 11 in high school. It's basically when I had started driving. So I started doing stuff with like picking up my brother and doing like you know, feeding him, doing the stuff once he gets home from school. Um, but I didn't realize at the time I was a carer. I guess like a lot of other young carers, I thought it was just something you do as um, like the older sibling, and particularly like I'm I'm Vietnamese background, so it's culturally very normal to take on that almost like sibling looking after your siblings role. Um, it was a bit different with my brother because at that time we didn't there were no diagnoses or anything around like just just knowing that. Yeah, he was maybe neurodivergent. We knew he had hearing loss, but um, he only has hearing loss on one side. So the peculiar thing about that is it's something that can kind of fall through the crack, through the crack, cracks. So um, it wasn't until I was actually in my final year of social work study. So that's almost probably five years later that on placement, I was sitting, listening to a presentation but uh, on carers and I sat there and realized that I was one of the people that were considered a kid and carer particularly as a young carer and it was for the first time that I had almost like this light bulb moment of like oh that's that's the experience I've been having because up until that point caring for my brother was something I kept very private I didn't, I didn't really want to explain or justify but of course it had a big impact on you know my ability to spend time with friends or spend time thinking about myself um, and so to finally have the language to describe what I had been going through for years you know especially when it was so hard at times and I felt like sometimes I felt like I was a parent that didn't choose to be a parent um, and that I was at times when you would have you know meltdowns I felt like I was failing like some really really hard kind of high expectations to put on myself um but when I realized it was I remember going up to the presenters and really just thanking them um because it just felt like for the first time I was validated my experiences and um yeah that was when I realized I was a carer and I probably didn't connect with any sort of formal services or do anything about it until a year later a year and a half later, maybe even two years, where in my social work practice or supporting carers and had a moment where I was like, oh, I should probably apply some of the logic to myself. Um, and then I started the process of calling Carer Gateway. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a little bit about the realizing I was a carer experience. Yeah, thanks for that, Jenny. And we hear really similar stories from a lot of young carers, especially. It takes a while, there's a few steps along the journey. Um, so um, very interesting to hear your experience there. And would you be able to comment, um, has identifying as a carer helped you? Has it enabled you to access more supports or receive any other help? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think when I called Carer Gateway after the intake process, they linked me in with Little Dreamers, which was great. And, you know, I was subscribed to the newsletters and I had a bit of carer counselling as well which was nice um, just in terms of validating the experience and particularly making sense of how being a carer has shaped me as a person particularly a young person where I was trying to make sense of my identity and um, the intersections of say what well, my cultural identity my sexuality um, being with Little Dreamers, eventually I was given the opportunity to be a youth ambassador, which was great. Um, they taught me a lot about policy and advocacy and leadership skills. And I, it definitely felt like an opportunity I wouldn't have been able to access had I not realized I was a carer. 
And on top of that, with Carers New South Wales, it was really good to, you know, connect with some of the workers who provided so much support and encouragement. And even being a carer rep now, um, just having a platform to share my voice, share my story and feel like I can contribute meaningfully to change and the, on a larger level, whether that's policy, like this opportunity here um, came out of that. So it's, it's really, really nice to be able to channel my lived experience like in an authentic way in, um, yeah, on a different platform. So very grateful for that. That's fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. So it seems to have opened up a new world for you in, in different ways, through support, through validation and through some leadership opportunities and development opportunities that you might not have otherwise had. Um, so we've heard um, a little bit about your experience, um, noting the topic today around care identity, care identification and well-being. Do you have any key messages or key takeaways that you would like to leave with those listeners? Well, I guess one of the big things about identifying as a carer for me was just finally having the language to describe my experience and connecting with others, like building a sense of understanding and a sense of belonging in some ways with other carers. And so I guess my big takeaway message is just to encourage keeping that, uh, being open to understanding that people can have such varying experiences that shape them to be who they are and they may not even have the the words to describe it but you know yeah. things like this where we're increasing education and awareness around carers I think it makes a really big difference because particularly for young people and for say hidden carers that are harder to reach groups um yeah it can make a really a world of difference to have that understanding and like that space of just yeah moment to listen yeah fantastic well thank you jenny again for sharing your experience and um we look forward to seeing how that connects with our other speakers today so i might hand back to elena um to continue with the program great thank you so much um sarah for leading the questions and jenny for sharing your experience i think um you know, again, the, the importance of um, identifying as a carer and then I suppose those different things that can flow on for that, from that that may or may not be um, directly associated with the caring role, but things that, um, that care identification that can lead to other opportunities, um, which I think, you know, Jenny explained really well in terms of, and I, I like the way that she um, said it enabled her to channel her lived experience in an, in an authentic way. And I think that was, um, that was you know, just uh, a great comment. So thank you, Jenny, again, for your, um, your time today and for sharing your lived experience um, around caring and identification. So our next um, speaker today is Associate Professor Anna Ugaldi. Um, and Anna is a behavioral and implementation scientist at the Institute of Health Transformation at Deakin University. He's leading a program of research to deliver supports and close the evidence to practice gap to ensure hospitals deliver best quality care with a focus on supporting carers. Her work has transformed existing services, supports, and programs resulting in improved patient care and she consults to government at a state and federal level. She's a 2020 Victorian Young Tall Poppy, a highly prestigious award for researchers with outstanding scientific outcomes and community engagement and she's also a past International Young Investigator of the Year. So I'm going to hand over to Anna now. Thank you very much um, to talk to us um, around your perspective around care identity. Thanks Thank Anna. You. Thanks, Selena. Um, and thank you so much, Jenny, for that um, wonderful um, introduction and, and story that you told. Um, so my name is Annie Geldy and I am a researcher at Deakin University. It is such a pleasure to present um, to this audience today. Um, as an academic, we are very good at presenting to other academics. And so it is such a joy to be here um, presenting to a broader audience. Um, I've conducted research on uh, family carers in particular, uh, often with a focus of, of people with cancer um, for about, uh, of about 15 years now. And um, so I'll be running through a few of our key studies and our findings and leaving you with a resource that we've recently developed. 
So my research project program has really focused on understanding the experience of carers, so particularly of people with cancer. Um, and in that program of work, I've developed and evaluated programs and supports for people. Um, my role has consisted of working with and across health and community services. So um, as an academic, I see my role as very much um, supporting uh, people who are facing forward. So health services, community services who are able to deliver care and support for, for carers. Um, and my, what I've tried to do with my program of work is have it really underpinned by listening to the care of voice. Um, we heard from Michael earlier on the importance of data, but also really ensuring that we are listening and having conversations with people. And I'm really proud that that's a key part of my, uh, my research program. Uh, it consists of broad stakeholder engagement. So I work with clinicians, I work with people affected by um, cancer and other illnesses, I work with carers, um, and I use a range of methodologies. So both qualitative uh, and quantitative. So we do listen to people and do interviews and analyze that with a very rigorous process um, and also do some survey data and deliver some programs and see whether people can improve after those. But also, uh, I really hope to understand the local context, um, which Jenny, I really uh, heard from your presentation earlier around um, where people are at in their lives and where they are at uh, with their family and how important that is to their, their experience. Uh, so I just want to begin by reflecting on um, what does it really mean to be a carer? And this is a quote that um, that I like and often refer to. It's a bit old now. It was uh, in 1990. But, but this, I think, builds on, Jenny, what you were saying around um, becoming a carer and falling into being a carer. But giving care to someone is an extension of caring about that person. And looked at this way, caring and caregiving are intrinsic to any close relationship. That is, they are present in all relationships where there is an attempt to protect or enhance in each other's well-being. And I really like this because I think it shows that um, we can all be carers. We are all carers to some degree, um, but it is when there is an extension of an existing relationship that we have with people that we do more formally step into a caring role. So what do we know? What do we know about how carers um, come into being a carer and what is their experience like? Uh, so the literature is quite clear on this. We've done some literature reviews and they show that carers often fall into the role rather than formally agreeing on it. Um, so we did some interviews, it was some time ago, um, and someone had said to me, before I knew it, I'd been doing it for six months. And so they they hadn't thought about being a carer. They hadn't recognised it, which I'm sure is a, um, a, familiar, a familiar, familiar story. I think it's really important to reflect on carers being a very diverse group. Carers are not all the same. And I think we, from an academic perspective and researchers can often think we can develop one solution that works for a diverse range of people. And um, I just don't think that's the case. Um, the literature is quite clear that many carers can have high levels of distress. And some studies suggest that carers can have more distress at times than people they are caring for. So it's a really important group that we really want to look after and, and protect. Um, but it's really important to note that some people don't have distress and some people aren't distressed all the time. This isn't the case of um, everyone needing some help, everyone needing something, everyone's got different needs and it's really important that we understand where people are up to. It can be a complex and challenging role, but it also really evolves over time. We know that it doesn't stay the same. Um, and some work that I've done, which collected data from both the patient and the carer at fixed points of time, shows that the carer role is influenced by and does to some extent mirror the patient experience, but it's definitely not identical. So that doesn't mean that when a carer is going badly, the patient is also going badly. These are individual people who um, have their own experiences. So what do we have, need to think about when we support carers? Um, uh, when I've delivered webinars before on this, um, people have often said that they thought they were attending to get some information on how they can provide care. And I think it's really important we differentiate between how do we support carers to provide care? They'll have questions around the needs of the patient. How can they meet that? What do they need to know? Versus how do we support them as individual people and empower them to meet their own needs and address what's important? A study I did uh, back in 2012, it was published, showed that identity is very important. So it's great to have that on the agenda today. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, there is also 
certainly a lot of health professional community and social support that can be accessed, um, which is really important. And then I'll be talking through some video resources. So, uh, as I said, uh, in 2012, we inter interviewed 17 carers and later we did another interview study with 21 carers and five health professionals. They were from a rural and regional area. Um, and we found that carers don't necessarily identify as carers, as, as has been talked about already today. Um, so this has real implications for the way services are set up, supports are set up, resources are set up. And it's interesting because while there are advantages to people identifying as a carer, they're able to access these programs, um, as Jenny, as Jenny mentioned earlier, there can also be a loss of people's own self-identity when they fall into carer roles. Our study really showed that uh, people can feel like they lose a sense of who they were, what's important to them. At times, caring roles can be overwhelming and that comes at a cost of things such as work, of external relationships and the things that make us who we are. So I think we've got a real balance here. We do want carers to recognise that there are supports and programs available, but also we want them to be able to take the breaks they need um, to be able to invest in themselves um, while they take on um, caring roles. The carers we interviewed were highly committed. That was across both studies. Um, this has never ceased to amaze me. Um, they can be very reluctant to accept help and take a break and focus on themselves, which, which is problematic when we try and provide support because they are very important, but the focus is so set up on the person who they're providing care for. Um, it, it can be challenging to um, encourage people to take a break. And we did find some early findings that suggested that self-identity could be linked to, linked to well-being. We haven't tested this with a big quantitative study um, and there's not a lot of research on this because self-identity can be a hard thing to measure. Um, but I would suggest that allowing people, when people potentially are able to access supports that can help them, yet still have a self-identity and still are able to do some tasks that they uh, value and that they identify as being tasks that they like to do, um, that, that can be, um, that can improve their well-being. I do have a quote here um, from the study and this is I just wanted to reflect on that quote that we I presented earlier around caring is intrinsic to kind of any relationship. And this carer, this was a young carer, um, and she talked about there's a skill you pick up with families being diplomatic and sometimes they'd be wor more worried than you. You have to pacify them, you have to coordinate the family. I'd say don't ring so often, but we'd get home and the phone would be ringing and I'd have 12 phone calls. And she talked about this job of making all of those phone calls, calling them all back, returning all of the messages when, she, when they got... Um, home from hospital. And I think this is a really important quote because it does show this is things that we all do um, in our relationships. We all um, keep a broader family abreast and up to date with uh, what's going on. But um, this is extensive and the things that we might think are kind of normal everyday tasks to carers are so much bigger because of the role that they're taking on um, and can be and can be burdensome. I'd like to now um, just talk about a different piece of work that we did and we really explored how our GPs can support carers and families as part of the care team and this really focused on what can be done to acknowledge carers as um, part of active members of the care unit. Um, we suggest that GPs are really well placed to support carers and they can be an excellent so, um, source of support both through individually but also they're often aware of broader support that's available and they could act as referrals into community and support services too. Um, and next, I'm just going to touch on some carer videos. So we developed a series of videos to tell the carer story. Um, these started with really a co-design process. So that consists of uh, getting a group of carers together in the room and talking to them around what's important, what would you like, what do these videos need to look like, what's important to you. And through that process, we had a series of workshops. We refined down the topic areas and um, then we did some filming with uh, 13 and we, we developed 13 carer videos and eight healthcare videos. These are videos that are for carers, but they have healthcare professionals in them that were developed. These uh, do have a focus on cancer, so they may not be relevant to everyone. Um, they may be relevant to some people and they are available um, publicly now on the Cancer Council Australia website. Um, this work was funded by Cancer Australia. I do have just a little bit of a snippet of a video to show you if I can get it working. Let me just have a look at this. I'll try and share sound. Thank you. 
actually you don't get much opportunity to look after yourself because you're so focused on, on, your, on your loved one. As things got a bit easier, I realised that I, I really did need to, to, to get out. I really did need to do my thing. One of the things I've, I've been writing is my life story. I've done 50,000 word life story, fully illustrated, fully with every photo annotated, all that sort of stuff. I do a lot of family tree work, and a lot of that was done in the early morning. Well, I'm just going to stop that there. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, but th there's a series of videos. There are 13 of them, um, or um, uh, 21 if you count the, the ones with health professionals that cover a range of topics. So if they are relevant, do um, jump on and have a look at them. Uh, so I'm just going to leave with my kind of academic thoughts. Um, I recognise that there's there's an excellent panel here today and, and um, these are my considerations from the literature around what can be done to support carers. And the first is I think we really need to recognise diversity. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that there can be changes to self-identity and as I said there can be positives and negatives to that. Uh, people may not consider themselves as carers which may have implications for how they can access support. The GP can act as a support but also link in with other supports in the community um, and as Jenny th said there are other programs, um, other community programs such as uh, Carer Gateway. We have developed the care of videos there up and this is an ongoing program of work with us. We're doing um, other, other studies which are underway. Um, and the final thing I would say is carers can be supported by empowering them to ask and drive their own help when they need it. Um, I do have a slide here just on, on the resources available. So there's some of my publications below and there's the web link um, for the videos, as I said. But if anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free to um, reach out and get in touch with me. Um, that My email address is there. I'd also just like to take a moment to fund my wonderful collaborators. Um, this program of work has been conducted over some time with many wonderful people. And the funders, um, Victorian Cancer Agency has, has um, funded me with a fellowship, two fellowships over the year. So I'm very grateful. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Anna. That was, that's uh, fantastic work. And I think really um, stressing that point around, it's not a one size fits all for carers. It is the diversity of um, caring experience, you know, experiences, but also relationships and, you know, some of the challenges that, that can be within some of those relationships as well. Um, and going back to that point, I think that um, we sort of mentioned earlier around making sure that that support is really, um, you know, specific to that carer and that caring situation, you know, so that it's really, it's really tailored. Um, and I also think, you know, your work's a really good example of, um, you know, researchers connecting, you know, directly with carers, co-designing those resources, great videos, really keen to have a look at, um, you know, some of the others there, uh, which really has that um, impact of improving health and wellbeing for carers. So thank you so much um, to you and your colleagues um, for all of your fantastic research in this space. Excellent and great to have you here today. Thank you. Um, so our third speaker um, for today is June Reimer. And June is a Dungaddy woman and deputy CEO of the National Peak representative organisation, First Peoples Disability Network of and for First Peoples with Disability. June has um, worked in the disability and community sector for many, many years, over 40 years, and shares her knowledge in an advisory capacity across multiple boards and reference groups. And, um, June really has a focus on ensuring the rights and culture of First Peoples are represented, respected and protected. June has represented Australia's First People with Disability alongside Indigenous leaders, leaders living with disability at the United Nations in both New York and Geneva. Um, and June was recently honoured for her life's work dedicated to creating systemic change to improve the lives of First Peoples with Disability as last year's winner of the 2021 New South Wales Aboriginal Woman of the Year Award. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to June, who's going to speak to us from her perspective. So a policymaker or practitioner's perspective around carer identity. So thanks, June. Hi, um, thanks, Alina. Um, before I begin, there's a lot of background feed. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on, I'm on Gadigal land here this morning also and pay my respect to those elders and any other Aboriginal people 
on this um, webinar today. And, and I'd like to um, acknowledge the last two speakers, um, really important um, narratives that they were talking about, particularly, you know, how people identify their self as a carer. So I think, you know, the, the, um, the theme of today around identity and identification has a long history for, you know, First Nations or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. And I, I think, you know, we need to move back to, you know, the history of colonisation when um, traditionally, you know, there were appropriate roles in communities before communities were split up. And generally that, you know, it was the mothers and the aunties that had those carrier roles in community. But um, in the inception of, you know, a lot of our men being moved away from um, their traditional roles, the women were left behind. And so they, they, you know, those roles of carers or providers for the community, for the individuals and others, you know, in, in that content, change the roles of, you know, for many in the community. So when we talk about identification, you know, our Aboriginal women, you know, were seen to be the rock in their community and step up. And it was just not formally identified, but, you know, their working community was just that as it is, you know, in their community. So when um, we speak about identification as, you know, that formal title carer, it just doesn't happen in our communities because, you know, those were the roles you, um, you know, you were identified with. And we also have to acknowledge, you know, in our communities that there may be many. Um, so even today, we were talking a bit singular ar around carer identification, but in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, there may be many carers within that family unit providing support to, you know, whether it's an elder or a person with disability. So we just have to be mindful when we talk about carers in that singular vote, because if we are if we start to identify one person, you know, as that carer, you're taking away the traditional roles of other people that may, you know, have different um, caring support roles for that individual or many individuals that may be in that family. So we, you know, so that's why sometimes when we talk about identification, you know, um, our families don't put their hand up about, you know, who is a carer, because there may be many in that family or in that community providing that support, and they all have different roles. The other point, you know, I think we need to uh, stress around identity is um, that, you know, for many of our um people that are doing these roles, they, they don't readily identify because um, of the past injustices with the welfare system and currently happening now. So a mother or an auntie or a grandmother or other, you know, maybe a father providing support, particularly, you know, for our children with disability, they're not going to put their hand up because there's a fear their child will be taking, taken. So, you know, or for some communities, some community groups and mobs, there's a shame factor around, you know, maybe having a child with disability. So, um, you know, I know in um, traditional groups up in the Northern Territory, you know, it's sometimes talked about, you know, married wrong way. So they married into the wrong tribe. So that's why they had a child with disability. So when we're talking about identification with carriers, you know, and the past speakers have talked about this. There's many areas that, you know, inter interject with that um, framing of, you know, formally what does a carer look like? Because it can, you know, come from many, you know, um, avenues in regards to our community. I mean, the other part why carers, you know, a lot of the time, um, don't want to identify because, as I said, there's that fear of, you know, um, racism, there's that fear of the welfare interjection, or there's that fear of ableism. So, you know, and an example would be, you know, a mother that may be caring for a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. So we already have these labels that, you know, Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islander people 
you know, may have a drinking problem. And we, and we do know that, you know, for example, fetal alcohol syndrome can be intergenerational and may not come directly from that, that mother per se. So, you know, we have to be, you know, mindful of st stigma surrounding, you know, our carers and, and how that looks. So, you know, um, that formal identification that I am a carer doesn't not necessarily walk, you know, work well in our communities. I think the other topic that we've really not talked about today too is, and, and it's not readily identified is, you know, some of our um, mothers or fathers who are, you know, carers within their family unit may have a disability themselves. So who's taking care of them or, you know, who is supporting them? So we sometimes, and we know this for a fact, you know, it happened, we've seen it, you know, across this country and particularly a lot in New South Wales. Those families, you know, the, the guardian or the parent who has a disability then has the child removed. And it's not about that they're not a good carer or they don't love the child or it's just that the system sees they're not capable of caring. So that's when we, we start using these formal labels of who is a carer and not, doesn't work well in our communities because when you start labeling, then it has connotations attached to that. And, and our families would rather not be, you know, identified in certain areas or certain roles because they don't know what the systems, you know, the system impact can have on them. The other issue is, you know, around, um, you know, when you start identifying people as carers, um, then, you know, what supports they need. So you'll have the service system coming in and going, well, you're entitled to this and you're entitled to this pension and that and then that can have ramifications in the housing setting, for example. So, you know, and I, I'm just talking anecdotally here. It's not for all of our people living, you know, um, in a caring role, but it has ramifications at times when you formalise, you know, a role or a setting for, you know, individuals So, and, and start labelling. So I think, you know, what we're talking about here that, you know, we need to allow people to self-identify first with, you know, without pushing them forward to have that label, you know, whether it's a person living with disability or a person as a carer, whether that's, you know, for a person with disability or, you know, um, elderly um, parents or other, you know, people that in their community. The other role too that, you know, culturally for, you know, most of our community is um, the kinship carer role. So, you know, within, in, within our traditional tribal groups, it's just passed on to, you know, the older sisters, aunties, the oldest grandchild, which happened to me, you know, also as being the oldest grandchild in our family. There's that obligation that you take on that kinship role without it being formalised. So, you know, you become a carer within your family unit, but it's not a formalised role. It's just the expectation culturally that, you know, that is your role in the kinship and, and um, cultural group uh, uh, how um, things, you know, happen within our communities. So I think, you know, when we talk about identif ident identity, you know, we need to understand that it's quite diverse, you know, as the speakers have said before, you know, me today, but we really need to tread softly, you know, when we're working with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, you know, um, those caring roles, as we said, can be culturally, it's just the way we do business and we don't want a formal label attached to it. I think um, the other one, you know, as Paul said earlier, I think it'd be really good to look at the research we did um, that Paul talked about. He was at the launch called Culture is Inclusion. And that research was the first time um, that people with disability, you know, were asked a simple question, tell us your story. And the work we did with that was the collaboration with the ABS. We collected the data. 
and, and what we heard from, you know, carers in community that, you know, we knew they were a carer, we didn't ask, you know, were they? But when they started telling their story, their cultural obligations in community, whether that was cultural business, caring roles or other identified areas, overtook their health and well-being. So that was the last resort, you know, so for many, particularly it was a lot of women generally, you know, their health and well-being came after the fact of cultural business, cultural caring responsibilities or any other responsibilities they had in that community. And we heard that, you know, loud and um, right across all communities across Australia. So, you know, for our carers, we really need to, you know, invest in how they can be supported, but still keep their cultural obligations within, you know, whatever community they're coming from. So I think I'll leave it there today, but, um, you know, there's a lot more to be discussed here, but I think, you know, webinars like this keeps that conversation open and um, free to, you know, let's all collectively come together and, and do the best work we can. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, June. I think um, really important points, but also, um, you know, I think the, the importance of self-identity um, that you mentioned, but also um, obviously the, you know, what you said around um, caring being seen differently or being experienced differently within Aboriginal communities and culture, um, which is important. But I think all of those things have a really important, um, important implications for policy. Um, because as you said, you know, there might be many um, Aboriginal people caring within that particular family or kinship care or community. Um, and sometimes that isn't always recognised by policy or the way that services are structured in order to deliver services. And I think the intent of the services is the right thing to deliver care support. But I think sometimes trying to, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's um, can then sometimes prevent, you know, a broader community getting support and in the way that they want it to be delivered to them. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's got some really important um, points that hopefully people will carry on in the discussion um, that we have um, coming up in the next hour. Um, but I think, yeah, really fantastic. Thank you so much, June. Um, really, really great perspective. And I'd like to just um, really thank Anna, June and Jenny um, for joining us and um, sharing their knowledge and their own experience and their own perspectives on um, identification, care identification and the importance of really culture and, and, and community um, within the caring space as well. So we're going to move into a series of breakout rooms um, for about uh, probably about 25 minutes or so, maybe a bit longer. Um, and you'll be allocated a breakout room uh, where you can contribute to further discussion on what we've just heard from our great three speakers from very different perspectives this afternoon. Um, so in the breakout rooms, we're going to discuss um, three questions which are up on your screen if you're having a look at the screen now. So um, they'll be also posted in the chat so you don't need to remember them. So the first question is based on the information presented today, um, in your own experience, what does it mean to identify as a carer? And I think importantly, taking in some of those concepts um, that June um, spoke about in the final discussion this afternoon. Um, the second question, how does identifying as a carer impact a person's well-being? And that, might, that will be from many different perspectives, as we've heard. Um, and thirdly, what are your ideas about improving carer identification? And I think in terms of that third question, taking account of those cultural differences and different experiences um, of caring, again, which June mentioned um, in her presentation. So if you can um, just wait for instructions on your screen, um, you can then, you'll be joining the groups. And then after the groups have concluded, we'll all come back into the main meeting room to have some feedback from each of the different chat rooms um, and share some of that information. So, um, I'll leave you now to go into the chat rooms and then we will uh, come back um, once those chats and discussions and uh, hopefully rich discussions have completed. Thanks a lot. Welcome back everybody. Um, I think we're all back into the 
one room now after the, the smaller chat rooms. Um, so we were just gonna have um, a brief overview of the discussion from each of the breakout rooms. Uh, so there were five groups. Uh, the first group um, facilitator was Sarah. So I'll hand over to Sarah to provide some um, feedback, brief feedback from the first group. Yes, thanks, Elena. And um, it was such a fascinating conversation. We didn't quite get finished, but I'm really glad we recorded. Um, just some brief points that we discussed in our group. Um, so one, one point was that identifying as a carer can be a way of speaking the language of government in order to access support, but caveat, not necessarily the right support. So identifying can access support, but then is that support correct? Um, another point that we discussed is that um, the impact of identifying as a carer can really differ depending on who the person that you care for is and what service settings that they're in. So a mental health carer might have a very different experience of identifying than a carer of elderly parents, for example. Um, we also um, talked about how carers might identify to perform an advocacy role. Um, and interestingly, that that might be critical to the well-being of the person they care for, but might come at a detriment to their own well-being. And we talked about the impacts of compounded stress through advocacy over years. Um, and then the, the final thing I was just going to raise that we discussed was that um, we not only need to think about carers self-identifying, but also how um, family and community identify carers, and particularly looking at that through a gender lens. So a woman might uh, not identify themselves as a carer, but be seen as a carer by their family. And similarly, a man may identify themselves as a carer, but not be seen as a carer. So they were some of the, the many interesting points we discussed in our group. Oh, great discussion. That's excellent. So, so many different um, perspectives there. So I'm glad that we've recorded it because I certainly didn't get all of that down, but um, some great points there. So thanks to, um, to group one for that um, obviously very rich discussion. And when you think there's enough time, there's always never enough time because there's so many different angles to these things. Um, so group two, um, uh, the facilitator and feedback person, there's um, Prue Granger. So Prue, I'll hand over to you. Hi. Um, so yeah, a lot of great things also in our group. So again, I'm very grateful it was recorded because there is a lot of um, wonderful and insightful information. Um, I think one of the um, overarching themes within our group in particular was um, this idea of identification in that for a lot of us becoming carers is it just is what you do. And so the capacity to be like, to label that um, can be really difficult. And, you know, there's a lot of um, things saying like, well, I'm just a husband, you know, or I'm just a daughter doing what I think is the right thing to do. And there was a beautiful quote by um, one of the gentlemen in our group. And he said, um, caring is just humanity. Where does it start and end? Um, and I thought that was really wonderful because I think out of anybody who is a carer, that is um, our humanity in that process. Um, there was some conversation um, in regards to the well-being element in question two about what identifying can kind of bring about. And it was on both ends of the spectrum in regards to, you know, identifying can bring you that positive support and can bring you, you know, access to different elements um, through governmental or financial support, et cetera. However, with that comes the issue of identifying the right language to um, work within the systems, which can be quite difficult to find what you need. Um, but then the other side of that was actually the negative experience of identifying as a carer. Um, so one big theme was once you identify as a carer, perhaps other people within your family group might step away from support. Um, and so then it becomes an even bigger responsibility on you as that main primary carer. Um, and a really interesting point that came up by one of uh, the people in our group was saying that you become a part of a system and that system needs structuring. Um, and so, you know, where do you find that structure um, beyond what you already know or where you're at? Um, yeah, I think those were the main, main points um, from our group. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Prue. Um, again, good points. Also different perspective to group one in, in some aspects, but also some similarities around that sort of spectrum of identification. You know, um, probably the good, the bad and everything else in between. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, we ran out of time. So 
It was getting quite interesting when we got to the 40 minute mark. Um, so yeah, um, general themes, um, but you know, people discussing their personal experiences. Um, the need to identify, what does it mean to identify uh, people were generally talking about, um, you know, the gains that you get out of that through social support um, and um, financial support. Um, a lot, a few people talked about multiple roles, um, acting as the carer to more than one person, either at the same time or over a period of time. Um, one person talked about um, the stigma um, of being a carer, particularly um, in the dementia context, um, and how that meant that they were cut off um, from people and, and there was a sense that it was not encouraged to identify as a carer because of the stigma attached to it. Excuse me, my voice. Um, one person did not actually like the label of a carer, which I've, I know we've all heard that before. Um, and so then in relation to the, um, impact on a person's wellbeing, um, we talked about particularly for young carers, um, being able to connect with, um, peer support, um, the social connection that you get when you when you are identified, and obviously the um, access to social services, um, all the different social services that you wouldn't know exist um, because you're now identified as a carer. Um, what else? One lady described herself as a cash cow for private providers um, in the NDIS world, which. I've experienced myself as well. So that was, that was an interesting description um, and a very apt description. Um, kind of you take on this new role, new kind of, um, yeah, purpose um, as a, you know, pro profit making for private providers. Um, and then we were really running out of time with the third one, but um, a general theme with the third one um, is care education and awareness. So we talked about um, um, people in allied health, for example, and GPs who might not necessarily understand the role of a carer or even know that you are a carer um, and how that can be improved. Um, yeah, whether, whether that's through training or advocacy. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. Great, thanks Georgie. I mean, again, I think um, comments around, you know, again, not a one size fits all, the comments you made around dementia carers, young carers, you know, needing quite different supports, but also seeing that care identification, um, the positives and the negatives of that, um, again, so, yeah, and I know I haven't captured everything, but that's um, just in terms of what stood out for me in terms of some of the comments there. So thank you and thank you to, to that group, to group four. And then our final group, group five, um, Jade's going to feed back um, on group five. Thank you, Elena. I'm actually getting Lucas <laughs> to be oh, okay. there. Sorry, Lucas. Thanks, Hi. Lucas. <laughs> Sorry about no that. Um, just to add, so we had very... Um, similar uh, topics in our group, uh, as we have already discussed. Uh, one interesting axis was sort of the difference between identifying uh, the consequences of identifying for oneself than one is a carer and for others and towards others. Um, that uh, it can be on the one hand, very clear uh, and important that um, to make it clear what you're doing is a carer as opposed to what you, you want for that. Uh, from uh, that relationship within which the caring is occurring, also for recovering from caring. Um, whereas, uh, for, uh, whereas caring, identifying oneself as a carer towards service systems is, of course, very important to, to get the supports. And a lot of that has been said about the issues 
um, surrounding that. Also that there is, of course, uh, still stigma attached depending on various contexts to being a carer um, and um, uh, yeah, um, that was uh, that was discussed a lot. The other thing that that maybe uh, our group could add was um, that uh, there could also be a reluctance to identify out of concern and respect for the person that is being cared for. Uh, and uh, we have heard some examples um, about the the safeguards that you could take to um, you know um, be respectful uh, when talking to others about you caring for towards the person that you're caring for. And um, yeah, the issue is though that um, on the one hand, it is seen as, as this um, thing that takes away takes away from from other relation forms of relationships, and on the other uh, hand, um, uh, there was this wonderful quote from one of our participants: "If we don't identify them, we will slip further into invisibility and receive less supports." So it's a very important thing that people identify as carers and that they us that what they're doing as carers. And I think that was the only point that we had time to discuss for the last question was that um, uh, to improve care identification, talk more about what's actually done rather than which label um, uh, that fits into. Uh, and that also would improve the well-being by getting the right supports for the people who do some things rather than other things. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Lucas, and thank you to, to Group 5. Um, I mean, I think what's come up a couple of times in the feedback then is about you know, the stigma associated with identification. Um, and I think that's probably something we haven't really looked at a lot in detail previously. Um, and might be, again, just another, um, I suppose, perspective on um, identification and care identification. So lots of really um, and diverse feedback there and great discussion, hopefully, in those groups. I know there's never enough time for these things, um, but I really thank everybody for their participation um, and for sharing their own personal experiences, um, but also their, their research, um, advice and information and observations um, from the discussions that we've had today. So I think that's been really great. So we are coming to the end of the, the formal part of today's um, event and the webinar, and we're gonna to finish today with a guided meditation which will be hosted by Prudence Rose Granger, the carer in residence at the Carer Knowledge Exchange. Um, so research and practice has shown us that we all benefit from these mindful activities. So I'm just gonna hand over to Prue. Um, we've probably only got a few minutes. I'm not exactly sure how long, but we're supposed to finish at four and it's two minutes to four. Um, so see how you go and how much time you'd like to take, Prue. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so outside of my role as a carer and in the Care Knowledge Exchange, I am a yoga teacher. Um, and in my own experience, the capacity to take a moment to focus in on my own well-being through a little bit of guided meditation can be very supportive. Um, so I'll keep this nice and quick about three or so minutes, um, as that's all we sometimes need. So making sure at first you're in a comfortable position and so if you're sitting in a chair making sure both feet are firmly planted on the ground and feeling your tailbone becoming heavy towards the earth and then adjusting through the body by feeling the spine becoming light as the crown of your head reaches towards the sky allow your front body to soften into the back and the back body to lean into the space or if there is something behind you supporting you. And then notice if, in, if with that shift of posture comes a shift in your awareness or your focus. And then bringing that focus to your naturally occurring breath. So the inhale and the exhale. And focusing on it, not for the purpose of trying to shift, change or judge the breath, but to fully immerse yourself in this practice that you do every single day without any thought. And this life affirming or giving experience. And perhaps as you next inhale, you focus on feeling the inhalation swelling the base of your belly. 
your waist and all the way up into your chest. And then allowing your exhale to soften the chest, the waist, the belly. Inhale, feel the belly expand, the waist expand, the chest fill. Exhale, let go. Feel the air soften all the way back down, returning to where it began. And in this process, you might notice your mind wandering. That is okay. It is its natural process. Just gently coax it back to that experience of breath. Allow the breath to anchor the waves of your mind. And as you next inhale, perhaps getting curious if there is more space you can take up within the body with that inhalation, spreading into pockets of the physical body that perhaps you've never felt the air enter into before. As you exhale, exhaling to completion, fully letting go of all the air you've taken in, to give yourself the opportunity for a full, complete inhale. And allowing your focus to be on that breath for the next five or so breaths. If the mind wanders, gently coax it back. The breath is your anchor. And when you feel ready, you can gently blink your eyes back open. <clears throat> Maybe acknowledging if anything has shifted for you through that experience. And of course, if you have any questions, thoughts or feelings, I will stay online for a little bit longer and you can pop it in the chat or feel free to reach out to me via the Care and Knowledge Exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Prue. That was lovely. I feel like I need to go and do something else now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone um, benefited from that. Um, it's always good to, to take a bit of time out, even just for a few moments. Um, so, look, that's the end of our um, session today. Um, so on behalf of Carers New South Wales, IPPG and the Care Knowledge Exchange team, um, I really like to extend um, a huge thank you to everyone who was attended today, um, all of the group facilitators, um, everyone that's participated. Um, it's been fantastic. But importantly, thank you to our three speakers, Jenny, Anna and June. Um, I think they really shared some great insights from different perspectives that has really led to great conversation. So, um, you know, we've the purpose of this was to explore and understand the relationships between care identity, identification and well-being. Um, and I think we've really opened up that conversation around that and lots of different um, perspectives and issues and challenges that come with that. So we invite you to continue to engage with the Care and Knowledge Exchange. Um, there's the digital platform um, and future events. And we've also got the um, Carers New South Wales um, 
conference coming up on the 12th of October. There's nothing informal about carers. And um, we've also got some new podcasts and things as well. So we look forward to sharing the recording and communique from this session, from this webinar today. Um, and we'll have that out to everybody shortly. So again, thank you everybody. Um, please stay engaged, um, up to date um, and great conversation and great ideas. So thank you to everybody. Cheers.